Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Light of the Valley. It is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, and really our, uh, our Bible readings and our message today is going to focus on God's Word. And sometimes when we take that stand on God's Word, sometimes it divides. Sometimes it breaks up instead of unifying. Uh, so we're going to look at what Jesus says about that, also what the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah said on that same topic. Our worship starts on page 3 in the folder by singing our first hymn, which is hymn 282, Lord, open now my heart to hear. So we'll begin our worship by singing hymn 282, God bless your worship. First reading for today 
it comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 to 29. And these words will serve as a basis of this morning's sermon. We hear. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? This is the word of our Lord. Second reading comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. These words from Paul, written to the Christians in a town called Colossae, they really remind us again of what we are because Christ has forgiven us and how we act, how we live because of that truth, because of what Christ has done for us. So we hear now from Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, <coughs> kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of our Lord. Please stand to sing the Alleluias. forgave us, how he made us one in that one body of believers, and there's a unity that comes from confessing Christ. But also when you take your stand on God, when you take your stand on what his word says, it also brings division. Jesus makes that clear to us here from Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. Jesus says, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Invite the children to come up for a children's message. <coughs>
phrase, I know I said it a lot when I was a kid, when I was like, yeah, maybe about Adrian and Nicholas's age. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You guys ever said that? <laughs> some, some haven't, some have. So maybe I can ask you guys, why do we say that? Why do we say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Because if you think words are going to hurt you, it's a shot. Yeah, it's kind of like, we say that almost like a shield. Like, hey, I, I, you just hurt me, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you it doesn't hurt me. Because I don't want you to know that it actually hurt me. You know, that's the thing about words. Maybe you guys already know this. Words can hurt. Words can hurt a lot, actually. And they, I, I know that even as a kid. You say it doesn't. They do. Yeah, they can hurt a lot. But the same way, words can also build you up. Words can also make you feel good. Words can make you feel loved. They can make you feel like somebody cares for you. Yeah, exactly. So there's words that can be said that can hurt us. <laughs> but there's also words that build us up. Yeah, like God. God yeah. said, call this to your parents. Okay. Well, see, that's the thing. We think about God's word, but you know what God has to say? You know what God says even more than this? God says, I love you. I want to keep you. I've taken away all the bad things you've ever done. And I have risen. Risen? Yeah. Let us do good things for our crew. And I, he, I, I, I let them take food and make good And he says, I will always be with you. See, and God's God words. God's yeah, and they're going to overcome any bad words anyone says to us. So words, yeah, they can hurt us. But words can also build us up. Words can make us feel great. Words can tell us that we are loved and that God will care for us. And that's what he's actually going to do. Yeah. But God's word can make us happy by letting us know what he's done. So let's thank God for him giving us those words. All right, let's fold our hands, bow our heads, and pray. Dear God, thank you for giving your word not just to tell us about the bad things, not just to tell us that we've done wrong, but to tell us that you took away the bad things, you forgave us, you love us, you'll be with us always, and you'll take us to heaven. Thank you for these most wonderful words that you have for us. Help us always to hear them and receive them with happiness and joy. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can head back to your comments. <laughs> We're going to continue by singing our next hymn. It's hymn 291. We have a sure prophetic word. Hymn 291.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word that we're going to focus on is from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 to 29, the first lesson we heard today. But as we begin meditation on that Word, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts to hear your Word. Send your Holy Spirit upon us that as we hear and understand that Word, that we would continue to grow in our trust in you, that your word is true, no matter what anyone else says. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Have you ever heard of the game Tribond? Tribond is where you take three things, three kind of random things, and they have some kind of association with each other, some kind of link, something that ties them all together. So just to give you kind of an idea of what it's like, I'm going to give you three words. See if you can tie them together somehow. Picnic, card, pool. And if you don't get it, it's okay. I tried this on somebody else, I didn't get it. All three are tables. Picnic table, card table, pool table. All right. How about this one? Candy, crab, caramel. Apples, somebody said it. They're all types of apples. What's the link between car, tree, and an elephant? They all have trunks. You see that? You're getting it now. All right, last one. Your last tri bond for today. Grain, fire, a hammer. <laughs> They're all words that God uses to describe his word. Now why would he do that? What link do these three words, grain, fire, and hammer that breaks rock into pieces, why link his word with that imagery? What's the point? You know, you have to consider, first of all, the context of Jeremiah. When it's being written, he writes it over a, a period of many years, but generally around the 6th century B.C., and it's shortly before Jerusalem is actually completely wiped out, completely destroyed. And what's happening is there are conflicting messages going around. There are people claiming that they have a vision, a dream from the Lord, and in their vision, in their dream, they say, no harm will befall us. We have peace and safety within these walls. Now, that sounds pretty good. In fact, Jerusalem has a history of being saved by the Lord at various times from various armies. But Jeremiah is stepping up saying, no, the walls are going to come down. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed and you're going to be taken away from this land. Both say they're from the Lord. Who do you believe? I think if we ask the question, who do you want to believe? That's a very easy question. I want to believe that I'm going to live in peace and in safety, that no harm will befall me. Because that's the much more appealing message. I don't want to hear, I'm going to be destroyed. I'm going to lose my home. I'm going to lose probably my identity. I'm going to have to live in a foreign country. But what they were wrestling with back then in the 6th century B.C., we still have to wrestle with it today. Whose message do we believe? Because you can have two preachers. You can have both of them say, I have a message from the Lord, and here it is. And one preacher will tell you, you know what? You don't have to worry about a thing. God loves you. God would never send you to hell. In fact, don't even believe in hell because God loves you too much to ever do that to you. But then there's another preacher who says, no, there, there is a place called hell. It does exist for people who don't believe in the triune God, who believe that Jesus came, lived on this earth, lived perfectly for us, died on the cross, rose from the dead, all to take away our sin, that that is that the only path to salvation, the only way to avoid hell. Which do you believe? Which should you believe? It's more appealing to say, God can't be that mean to send people to hell. God 
God should never want his creation to suffer, so let's just believe there's no hell. Let's believe there's no consequence for not believing in him. Instead of believing that there is a place of horrible, unspeakable, eternal torment, the depths of which you don't even want to ponder. Or if you have two preachers, let's say they both agree there is a hell, but one says to avoid hell, you just got to give it the old college try. You got to give all your efforts. You got to do a lot of good works. At the bare minimum, you're just trying to outweigh your good with the bad. If you do that, you're good. But another preacher says, try as much as you want. The bad will always outweigh your good. Because God demands perfection. You can't be perfect. Someone's going to have to do that for you. Who do you believe? On the one hand, it appeals to me that I could do something to make me better than others. That I could do something that would elevate me a little bit more. That if I just put a little bit of effort into, me, into it, into my eternal salvation, I will go to heaven based on what I do. I don't like being taken out of control. I don't like being told I can't do it. So it's harder to believe someone has to do it for me because it's impossible for me to do. Whose message do you believe? God knows about the messages being preached during Jeremiah's day. He knows that some people are prophesying with these dreams, saying there's no harm, no destruction that's going to fall upon Jerusalem. And he knows what he's told Jeremiah. He knows it all. He says himself, I fill heaven and earth. Nothing in this world happens without me knowing it. I'm not a God far away, removed from this planet, not interested. I am right here dwelling in it, and I know what's going on. So he gives us a litmus test of sorts. Something that we can look to to know whether or not this is his word. He says, let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream. And let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? So grain fire, and a hammer. These three words are going to show us that God's word is true. What has straw to do with grain? Straw, straw is not filling. It's not substantive. You can't live on straw. Even your animals can't live on straw by itself. You've got to mix something else in there. That's why straw is used for bedding. Maybe as filler but not as the meal. I mean, if you want to think about it in terms of our diet, and, you know, and I don't think you guys have grown off and eating straw, but you know what we do eat? Junk food. And we like it. It tastes good. And we would prefer that as opposed to something that we know is good for us. If you hand me a plate of Brussels sprouts or a plate of Doritos, I want the Doritos. I don't want the Brussels sprouts. It tastes good. And you get down to it, you look into the nutritional value, and you know if you consist your diet on junk food, it's not going to be good for you. You're going to be malnourished. You're going to have health problems. It's not going to sustain you. When people preach a message that goes against what God has always said, it's a straw message. It's a junk food message. It tastes good. It's appealing. But in the end, it's going to leave us empty. It's going to leave us malnourished. It's going to wreck us. So Jeremiah takes the time right now to say, wait a minute, these, these other prophets, they're saying that no harm and no destruction will befall you. If you wait to find out whether or not that's true, it's going to be too late. 
Because you're going to have fed yourselves on these words that whole entire time. You're going to be living in a promise. But when that day comes and the Babylonians are camping outside the walls, when the day comes and those walls fall down and, and your temple is destroyed and your capital is gone and your hopes and dreams, they're going to be completely empty. The same way your town is. The same way your life is lived on these words. So Jeremiah tells them to turn away from that message. To go for something else. To go for something substantive. Something that will fill them. To the grain of God's word. We think about this world and there's a lot of straw messages. A lot of junk food messages that are being preached. People will say there's many paths to God. Choose your own adventure. It's fine. They all go to a happy place. They'll say, it doesn't really matter what you do. Just try your best. You'll get there. And those messages are kind of appealing. Just like it is to say that there's no hell. It's kind of an appealing thought to say that there's no way I can fail at this and that I'm only going to get something good out of it. But in the same way, when you look back at God's word and bring it into picture, you say something different, something that's not appealing. To say that, well, if you take a stand on the word of God, you're going to be divisive. You're going to cause people to walk away from you. You're going to cause schisms and splits within the family if you and say that there is only one path to salvation. There is only one God who's revealed in three persons. When you say those things, when you take your stand on that word, people are going to disagree with you. That's going to cause division. But yet at the same time, it's the word that has always been preached. It's the word that hasn't changed. It's the word that takes your situation, that looks at your life and says you need to be rescued and it tells you how it was done, that it was completely and totally accomplished by God himself, by him coming down from heaven to live for you, to, to, to keep all those laws perfectly. And then finally, upon the cross, when he says, it is finished, he truly means your salvation is completely taken care of. Every ounce, every little bit that needed to be done was done. And the payment, the wrath, the debt that our sins incurred, it was wiped out on the cross. Your salvation is filled in a complete way when you step back for a moment and say, God has promised punishment. I haven't lived up to his standards. But he did it all for me. With no contribution. With no, no effort on my part. He accomplished it all for me. That's a grain message. That's a message that fills you up. That's a message that sustains you. And that's a message that God says will sustain you not just today, but until the hereafter to all eternity. That's the grain of God's word. But he also says, my word is like fire. Fire burns up. Fire consumes. Fire destroys. What does it destroy? Well, ask yourself, the people who were listening to those other prophets, the ones, who, I had a dream, I had a dream, Jerusalem will be saved. What happened to their message? What happened the day when they looked back and they saw Jerusalem burning? When they saw a rubble heap with smoke rising up from it? Their hopes that these prophets were right were disintegrated, turned to ash. Again, Jeremiah is warning them before it's too late, before this happens, don't Put your hopes in that straw message because when the fire of God's word comes, when his judgment comes, it's going to burn it away. You'll have nothing. 
when we listen to just what we want to hear. We're in danger of attaching ourselves to kindle, to what can start and become a fire. God's word will burn away all the lies. You think about the history of God's word, how many times have people tried to literally burn the Bible? to get rid of it, to destroy its message so that it would no longer pass on. And yet, how many things has the Word of God been preserved through? How many wars? How many countries that decided that there is no God and they tried to destroy it, yet it still survives, it still prevails? It survived against persecution. It will survive until the very end. And why shouldn't it? That's what God said it would do. And in the end, it will burn away all the lies. If we attach ourselves to those lies, we can expect judgment. We can expect the fire of God's word. Because his word is also like a hammer. A hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. What the prophets said, what those other prophets of Jeremiah's days said, it made sense. God has a, has a history of saving his people. There's been times before where the enemies have come to the gates of Jerusalem, and yet he pushed them off. He saved them. So, sure, why wouldn't he do it again now? But yet God said well before that, if you disobey me, if you do not follow my commands, I will take you out of this land. The day the siege engines started hammering into the walls of Jerusalem, you understood what it was like that the word of God is a hammer. That just as you take a sledgehammer to a piece of, of cement, you hit it and you hit it and you hit it, and it doesn't start forming cracks immediately, but then after more effort, it starts breaking apart until it's beaten to nothing but, but pebbles. These things that these false prophets are saying, they seem solid. They seem like something I could build on. But it went against what God had said before. And then the time came, and it happened just as God said it would. The day those walls were hammered and fell in Jerusalem, again would be the day when they would realize the word of God is like a hammer that breaks rock into pieces. God's word has hammered more than just on, in this way, physical walls. When we think about the stoniness of our own hearts, the hardness that's there. The hardness that existed, maybe for some of us a long while ago, maybe it's still something you're struggling with now, a hardness that doesn't want to listen to God, that wants to make your own path. A hardness that wants to say, I can do it. And yet his word, the more we hear it, the more it broke it away, the more it chipped away until finally he broke our pride, he broke our arrogance, he broke our self-reliance. And he said, you can rely on me. You can build on me because I am the rock. I'm the rock that is solid, that will never be broken to pieces. I'm the rock that if you build on, your house will stand no matter the storm that comes. Because I am solid. I prevail. The world can hammer against me, and you know the world has hammered against the Lord. They've come up with clever philosophies. They've come up with all these, these scientific evidences that says, no, God is debunked. God is not true. And yet what happens? Their reasons, their philosophies, those go the way of extinction. Those go away. And yet God's word continues to stand, built solid on the rock of Jesus Christ. God's word will never crumble. It will never be destroyed because that's what he said it will do. His word instead will destroy the ideas that stand opposed to it. 
So ultimately, what does it matter to us that God's word is like rain, is like fire, is like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? It's understanding that just as it was in the 6th century BC, just as it is in the 21st century AD, there are always going to be people who try to destroy the word of God. Always going to be people who <coughs> preach against what God's word has always said. So we put our hope and our trust in what is solid, on what can withstand the flames of hell, of what is grain that fills us up, because the only message that does that is God's word, is what he promised to do, is the very fact that God has lived for you, God has died for you, God has saved you. That's the word that you have. That's the word of God that when you think about, when you pick up a Bible, you have it in your hands. That it's on your lips to know that simple message, to know that he is my rock, my refuge, my source of salvation. That will, when we put our trust in that, nothing will make it crumble. Nothing will destroy it. In fact, his word will destroy all other man-made ideas. His word will prevail. It may not be the dessert. It may not always be the message that tastes good. But his message is the one that has endured. His message is one that will continue. If he is our rock, our refuge, and our salvation. We put our trust in him. And speak his word faithfully. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to join at the top of page 8 where we'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, just a note before we gather our offering to the Lord. Uh, if uh, you're a guest or visitor with us, joining us today, first of all, we're glad you came to join us. Uh, but if you would like us to follow up with you later this week, there are little information cards that are in the pews. You can fill those out with your name and contact information, and I'll follow up with you later this week. You can put that card in the offering plate as it comes around, or hand it to me or one of the ushers at the end of the service today. So with that in mind, let's continue our worship by gathering our gifts and offerings to the Lord.
Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, once again we've enjoyed the privilege of gathering in this house of worship to hear your holy and precious word. May its message of salvation through Christ alone stir up our hearts to faith and love and produce the full fruits of good works. May we not forget your word, which we have heard, or bring shame upon it by our lips speaking against it, our hearts not believing it, or our lives not living by it. As our sins plague us and constantly remind us of how we've fallen short of your standard of perfection, let your word, that the blood of Jesus Christ blots out our sin from our memory and present us faultless before you and grant us eternal life. Keep your word in the minds and hearts of our loved ones not present with us this day. Return them soon to fellowship with us as well as in uh, all Christians around the world. Through the Spirit, open the scriptures more and more to our understanding that we might know you better, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent to save us. The Lord make your truth known to all people everywhere. Use us as the instruments to bring your true saving message to all people, whether near or far, so that they too may enjoy the blessedness of heaven. Preserve all those who travel, protect all those who are in danger, and provide the needs of all people. Comfort and relieve all who are in any way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate. To your praise and glory. Gracious Father, look with favor on our land and bless us according to your mercy. We must devout and faithful rulers, that we may not be governed according to the sinful desires of man, but according to the truth of your word and your ways. Keep our military in safety, guarding them as they offer up their lives for our security. Sanctify our preserver, we give you thanks for the faithful lives of the saints, that you guided them into all truth and rescued them from the lies of this world. Keep all believers in that same truth. Now we ask you to hear us, Lord as we bring you our private petitions. your hands, dear Father, we commend all of these petitions, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to grant us these requests as you see fit and as you see best. Now we pray as your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank mm -hmm. you.
thank you for coming out and joining us uh, to gather around the Word of God, the Word that has not changed over, you know, 3,400 years-ish, um, that it just remains the same Word, the same Word we get to hear week in and week out. His promises have not changed. We've only seen them fulfilled. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, we just have some uh, announcements for you this Monday, so tomorrow, if you fancy yourself for a picnic and maybe watching a movie out in the park, uh, there's information there on the announcements. Uh, we'll meet kind of about 7 o'clock. If you kind of want to get an idea of where to go, um, go give uh, Alan Emery a call. I know they're just on a little getaway this weekend, so they're not here this morning. Uh, but you can uh, give Alan a call, see where uh, he's meeting if you want to join together with other people at Light of the Valley. And then this coming Saturday, the 20th, this will be our, our last men's group on the Bible study, Facing Disaster Like a Man. So uh, come and join us for that. We'll start a new one uh, in September. Uh, the rest of the information you can see there. Um, I guess also note meditations. We do have the new fall ones out, so you can grab one. You can grab a couple if you want, like handing them out, passing that along to other people. And next Sunday will be the last day we collect school supplies for E.G. King Elementary. Um, the, the tubs there are a little deceptive because there was so much people were tripping over stuff. So we had to go and move that into the back room, and Sunday school room. Uh, so thank you for all your generosity um, as we've continued to gather supplies uh, for the students at E.G. King. So with that, just say hello to the people you come to worship with. Um, Stick around, and uh, I'll get to the back. Shake your hand. Wish you God's blessings on your week.